He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Packed inside every cell in your body is a set of genetic instructions. We are here to celebrate the completion of the first survey of the entire human genome. Without a doubt, this is the most important, most wondrous map ever produced by humankind. This is the coronavirus, and inside it is ribonucleic acid, RNA. That's like our DNA. Now, scientists have taken that RNA and are breaking it down into a very complicated genome sequence. The gene editing method, known as CRISPR-Cas9, has transformed the molecular life sciences. We've been modifying genes, not by gene editing, but by selective breeding from the beginning. How else can you turn a wolf into a chihuahua? That's what we've been doing. We just know how to do it better today. Today, uh, we are really pleased to announce that, as promised, the government will end the effective ban on gene technology in New Zealand. Kia ora, no mai haramai ki te au hurihanga. Hello and welcome to Our Changing World, ko Claire Kincannon tēnei. The last few years, there's been a lot of chatter about genome sequencing, bioinformatics, gene editing, and as of recently, proposed new regulations for genetic modification in New Zealand. So what's happening in this space and where to next? To introduce you to some of the work happening around the country, we've got a series of videos made by Damien Christie of Aotearoa Science Agency for Genomics Aotearoa. They're up on our webpage and on the RNZ YouTube channel. And when you're finished listening to this, you should definitely go check them out. But first, here's Damien Christie with a bit of a taster of some of the research. Genomics is the study of DNA, and so not surprisingly, finds its way into every avenue of science that involves living things, from humans to animals, plants and insects, right down to fungi and even bacteria. As much as the science of genomics has progressed, one of the biggest advancements has come in the form of faster, cheaper sequencing of DNA. When the first human genome sequence was completed in 2003, it had taken 13 years and cost several billion dollars. Just a few years later, that was down to a mere million. And today, a complete human genome can be sequenced for less than $1,000. In practice, this means genomic techniques can now be applied much more widely. From sequencing stoat DNA to establish how many breeding pairs might be left on Waiheke Island, to understanding the origins of a single cancer tumour. Professor Chris Print from the University of Auckland. Cancers are really DNA diseases. A single cell develops a mutation which takes a little bit of out of its normal growth controls and then slowly develops more and more mutations and it's kind of like Darwinian evolution where those cells that have mutations that let them grow faster and faster and survive better, they start to take over the tumour. It was genomics that led University of Otago professor Parry Guilford and his team to identify the gene that was causing a deadly stomach cancer in a large family group which included singer Stan Walker. Pinpointing the CDH1 gene is estimated to have saved at least 400 lives, as those affected now opt for prophylactic surgery before cancer appears. Parry says as well as understanding inherited risks, genomics is being used more and more to help detect the cancer sooner and treat it more precisely. One important application that we um, have for DNA technology is in cancer diagnostics and cancer screening. So as a tumour develops, it will undergo various mutations in genes which are involved in cell proliferation, cell survival, uh, cell invasion. As the tumour grows, it will spill some of that DNA into the bloodstream. So you can take a blood sample from someone and if they have cancer, you will see traces of mutated DNA in there. Parry believes this combination of understanding risk, early detection and personalised treatments will be a game changer for the fight against cancer by the next decade. I think in the future the entire genome will be sequenced, if not at birth, soon after birth. So in time we will be able to find cancer at an early stage. And if you find it early, you can cure the cancer with simple surgery. There's no, no need for ongoing chemotherapy, you know, fancy immunotherapies that can be cured very simply with surgery. So we're very confident we can change the, the, the way that cancer is treated in this country and also reduce the cost of the cancer care at the same time. In 10, 20 years, I think we'll see 
the whole thing will be a different game. I think the way we fear the disease today, that will no longer be the case for our children and our children's children. While the idea of every baby having their genome sequenced at birth may seem far-fetched, and to some, even a step too far, there's one species in Aotearoa where that's already a reality. In 2018, Kākāpō became the first species in the world to have its entire population's genome sequenced, around 150 birds. The population of the giant parrot had previously fallen to just 51 birds, and inbreeding was a real issue, with the majority of eggs failing to hatch. The Kākāpō Genomics Project has been led by Genomics Aotearoa, a collaborative group of researchers from 10 universities and Crown Research Institutes across the country. Its co-director, Professor Peter Dearden, says at first he was unsure what the point was of sequencing all these birds. I must admit, I was one of the people sort of saying, I'm not really sure what we're going to do with this data set and whether it's going to be useful. And it turns out that actually it is, but it takes more than sort of standard analysis. What we wanted to do was to provide the Department of Conservation with effectively a way of saying, you know, is this kākāpō chick that's just been hatched, is it thriving or is it in trouble? Do we need to intervene? And to do that, we, we had to predict the growth rate of that chick based on the genome sequence of its parents. And so you have to take all of the information you know about the growth rates of a kākāpō compared to their genome sequences and work out how much of the variation in growth rates in chicks over all the birds that we know about has got something to do with the genome. Because of course, much of it is going to be what island they're on, what they're being fed, you know, what the weather's like. We need to find ways to take all of that information that is important but not in the genome and sort of put it to one side and say, okay, given this, can we predict the growth of a chick? And a lot of the tools for doing that are actually the same tools that, that companies like Uber use to determine their surge pricing. While the AI analysis used in the Kākāpō Genome Project is incredibly complex, genomics is increasingly being used by citizen scientists around Aotearoa. Community conservation groups taking samples from their local waterways are able to have an environmental DNA or eDNA analysis conducted, which can show every living species that's come into contact with that stream, from mammals to birds and fish right down to bacteria. The Environmental Protection Agency has been funding many of these projects. Vanessa Crow. It's very accessible. Young children through to scientists through to Kaimatua can go and discover what's living in their waterway. The big thing for many groups is knowing what are the special species, the tonga, that they want to protect and what are the nasties, the pests and invasive species that they want to try and remove so that they can really allow their ecosystem to thrive. Which species are and aren't found in waterways is a good way to determine a waterway's health. More sensitive species of native fish and coda are less likely to be present in a polluted river, which will instead be dominated by certain species of worms, as DOC's former Chief Science Advisor, Professor Mike Bunce, explains. So what we've done when we've developed this index called the Tiki Index, which is a stream health quality index, if you like, is try and identify the things that are found in healthy rivers all the way to things that are only found in degraded rivers. We're able to determine where on that spectrum it sits, whether it's good, bad or average, and then we're able to determine where your particular sample sits on that, and indeed whether that sample is changing over time. As well as helping community groups assess their local restoration projects, eDNA has been used to determine the impacts of large-scale weather events, such as Cyclone Gabriel, and detected the presence of the invasive golden clam months before it was officially picked up. Mike believes eDNA is a key component in the fight to save our environment. So we're in the middle of a biodiversity crisis globally and New Zealand is not immune to it. So how do we approach this? Well, we need to listen to nature effectively and what it's telling us. How are our species responding to the changes that we make? So if we can listen to nature effectively through environmental DNA and look at everything from the microbes to the mammals and everything in between, we're able to hopefully, and this is the goal of it, is make better decisions. And it's time for good decisions. Understanding why some species thrive better than others is the focus of another genomics project. Dr. Ange McGoffrin heads up the Invasomics Lab at the University of Waikato. I'm really interested in what makes a species invasive from both an ecological perspective and also a genomic perspective, trying to understand what kind of traits and what kind of genomic elements really drive successful invasion. 
I'm looking at insects because they're very simple to rear and collect in the wild and rear in, in, under lab conditions. We can set up colonies where we cross more invasive and less invasive species, for example, in reproductive crosses. We can look at fitness traits and we can look at things like tolerance to different environmental challenges like temperature or desiccation stress. So we can identify the Achilles heel of these invasive species and try to use that to inform new management practices. Whether it's choosing which kākāpō to relocate or which drug to use against a tumour, much of genomics is simply about providing the right information to enable these better decisions. But for some scientists, understanding which part of a gene makes an organism behave in a certain way also means the ability to alter that gene. At Plant and Food Research, Professor Andy Allen has been using CRISPR gene editing, a tool that makes a precise change to one specific part of a plant's gene to help apple trees adapt so they continue to fruit in the face of warmer winters. CRISPR is really cool, in my opinion. It's an enzyme that goes into the cell and it goes and makes a variant in exactly the place you want it to go to. So it'll go in and search the DNA of the apple and make a change in the area you direct it to. So if you've got a, a major gene that's stopping flowering, you can get the CRISPR enzyme to make a, a variant of that gene or destroy the gene completely, and then the plant will flower more often. Food security is on the mind of ag research scientist Dr Brent Barrett too. In a field in Palmerston North, his team have planted hundreds of varieties of ryegrass and are searching for which genes might hold the key to survival against more frequent and severe droughts. And what we're doing is comparing under a drought scenario and a rain-fed scenario to look at how those plants will actually stand up when they're faced with droughts. So they're side by side in the field, but one's got a roof that goes back and forth over the top. So whenever it rains, roof goes on, they stay dry. And so they just get drier and drier and we see how they stand up and that allows us to find that DNA fingerprint that's associated with a really hardy plant that's going to survive under drought. While humans have been altering plant and animal genes for centuries through crossbreeding, new techniques like CRISPR mean those changes can be made more quickly and precisely, which Andy Allen argues is exactly what we need in the face of a rapidly changing climate. Plant genomics is one of the tools that will answer the food security issue. Plants can produce food way more efficiently than any, anything else. And if we help them cope with the climate crisis, we can use them as a tool to turn back the tide. Thanks, Damien. And there's more on all those stories in the videos on our webpage. But to the last story, and the topic of altering genes. Here's Prime Minister Christopher Luxon. From the end of 2025, research and trials of gene technologies and products, including medicines and vaccines, based on gene technologies, will become available in New Zealand. And look, I know that in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was fierce concern, debate and protests around genetic modification in Aotearoa. But the government has announced this proposed new legislation. And with all those years past, which have brought better understanding and huge changes in the technology, the time has come for more discussion. So, you know, let's talk it out. Let's get to know a bit more. First, quick jargon check, because it's a lot. I know it's a lot. The government is using the term gene technologies to essentially talk about genetic engineering or genetic modification. So it's all the same making a change in a living thing's set of genes or genome. There are different techniques to do this. And look, some of the ones from back in the day were, well, a bit clunky. Like, you could put a piece of DNA into a genome, but you wouldn't know exactly where it had gone. So maybe it was messing up a different gene or something. One of the relatively new kids on the block is called gene editing. And this is where you can make really precise changes in a specific part of your chosen gene. This is what Damien and Andy Allen were talking about. It's done with a tool called CRISPR-Cas9. Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020. Yeah, a Nobel Prize within 10 years of its discovery, which is a major science flex. And it's one of the massive advancements that have happened over the last two decades, says Professor Emily Parker. The other big change Damien has also mentioned. I guess the other thing that goes with that is the power of sequencing. There always was some concern about knowing when people had made intended genetic change whether, whether they had indeed made that genetic change and tracking that, if you like. The sequencing 
has changed very much that landscape. Um, we can now sequence all of the DNA of organisms so we can detect changes that we have made or that have occurred naturally far more readily than we used to be able to do. But let me properly introduce Emily, because she's got two hats and you need to know about both of them. I'm Emily Parker. I'm a professor of chemical biology as part of the Ferrier Research Institute at Victoria University of Wellington. But I'm also currently on a half-time secondment to the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment as a departmental science advisor. And when she wears her first hat, her professor hat, she uses genetic modification. Under our our containment facilities, under our labs, we're using genetic modification, um, both of bacteria and of fungi. And what kind of research are you doing? So we're particularly interested in reprogramming fungi to make exciting new compounds. So fungi are an untapped source of amazing pharmaceuticals, some medicinal products and other pesticides, for instance. And we want to use genetic engineering tools to help us harness some of that um, exquisite bioactivity that fungi have. As one of my students likes to to term it, turning mould into gold. When she heads into the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, she slips on a different hat, her advisory hat. The Ministry has a range of science advisors, all with different expertise. Um, I started the role at the end of July last year on a two-year half-time secondment from my standard role uh, at the university. And, of course, At the end of last year, the Ministry was instructed around preparing policy work around changing genetic technology settings for New Zealand. Um, Obviously, with my expertise in that space, the fact that I was actively researching in that space meant that I was well-placed to assist the work going on in the Ministry. Emily chairs the Technical Advisory Group, helping officials in the Ministry to understand the relevant science, risks and techniques to make the legislation. Also on this group are 12 other researchers, mostly from universities and Crown Research Institutes. And there are two other groups, the Māori Focus Group and the Industry Focus Group. Where New Zealand is at right now is that since 1996, genetic modification of organisms has been regulated by the Hazardous Substance and New Organism Act by the EPA, the Environmental Protection Authority. So they deal with applications when people want to import, develop, or release genetically modified organisms. And their approach is precautionary. Everything gets assessed. Since 2003, by a rapid pathway if it's deemed low risk, or if higher risk, by a rigorous and full approval pathway. And there's an extremely high bar to be crossed before anything can be released into the environment, or even to do field tests. And it takes a lot of time, money and effort for researchers to apply and keep up with the paperwork. Many scientists say the setup is unnecessarily restrictive, especially in light of those recent advancements in the science. A leading scientist is welcoming the end to a gene technology ban, saying New Zealand's missed opportunities because of the outdated rules. This is not to say that there's no genetic modification happening in New Zealand. It is happening. Most of it in labs. There are a very small number of EPA-approved outdoor field trials happening, also within containment. The Crown Research Institute Scion is investigating a range of different genetically modified pine trees. For example, looking at whether they can improve wood density, herbicide tolerance, and alter the tree's reproduction abilities. A particular modification that's garnered interest because it could help address the issues New Zealand has with the spread of wilding pines. Ag Research also have an ongoing trial with different genetically modified goats, sheep and cows. One example is that they're investigating genome edits that might help cows adapt to warmer temperatures. Another is cows that produce milk with very low levels of beta-lactoglobulin, which is what triggers allergic reactions to milk. They are also continuing to monitor some transgenic animals they have – Now, transgenic is the term for when genes from one organism have been put into another organism's genome. In the past, ag research developed cows and goats that expressed human therapeutic proteins in their milk. One aimed at helping multiple sclerosis and the other an anti-cancer agent. 
GE Free New Zealand opposed this work and challenged their research approval application in the courts. The only genetically modified releases in New Zealand to date, so that means outside of containment, have been in the medical and veterinary areas for vaccines or disease therapies. And in the therapy side, it's mostly been for cancer therapy clinical trials. For example, the latest release approved by the EPA from May this year, has enabled a phase two clinical trial for a type of cancer therapy called CAR T-cell therapy. A breakthrough cancer treatment being developed here in New Zealand, which uses a patient's own immune system to find and destroy the disease, is a step closer to market. So that's the current story in New Zealand. Genetic modification is happening, but it's very tightly regulated. Professor Emily Parker says that with the proposed changes... The government's goal is that risks are clearly assessed and that the processes are streamlined. For instance, if people are trying to look to commercialise or to bring to the market or to introduce new therapies, um, that development work, which can entail a significant amount of investment for people, having the regulatory certainty over what is approved or what will be approved or or likely to be approved is really appealing in terms of getting appetite to do the work. And what about overseas? Have there been changes in the regulation settings in other countries? There certainly has been some movement. Many international jurisdictions um, have changed to consider specifically the the gene editing. That's what people call the precise techniques associated with um, things like CRISPR-Cas as gene editing. And we have seen some changes and proposed changes. Even the European Union is undertaking work on proposed changes to their um, regulations specifically around plants to be much more permissive of gene editing techniques. So what's this proposed new plan and how will it work? What there is is a kind of graded regulatory scheme. So there will be some things which are considered low risk and therefore they may need to be done under certain conditions, um, but they won't need to be notified to the regulator. There will be other things that will um, be considered to be at the slightly higher risk or need a clearer regulation and those will be notifiable to the regulator. And then you come to the licence category where an application will be have to be made to the regulator prior to undertaking that work. This tiered system is based off the Australian model, but with some adjustments. One is that there's a second layer of consideration based on whether the activity is to be carried out in containment, to be released to the environment or to be used in medical applications. Non-notifiable activities would be very low risk, including, for example, routine lab research and CAR T-cell therapies for patients. So the non-notifiable, there will be conditions on non-notifiable activities. Um, There will be certain constraints about how those activities are undertaken and what happens with the organisms that are created from those activities. But the applicant won't need to get approval from the regulator before, but they will need to do the work according to the um, legislation. And it's true for notifiable too. It's just they will also have to inform the regulator that that work is being undertaken. For all levels, Emily says, the assessment is solely about risks. So it's not weighing benefits versus risks. And it's not just focused on the fact that genetic technology is being used. It's more about what it's being used to do and what the outcome of that will be. So you'll be looking at what happens because you make that change and determining how that should be controlled for under what conditions that it's appropriate to undertake that activity. So you'll be actually looking at at the risk of what you do, not just a theoretical risk of what you change, if that makes sense. So, I mean, I guess in a scientific terms, we'd talk about genotype and phenotype. So genotype being what's actually the sequence changes to the gene and phenotype being what we see in the organism. What is the change in the organism that we see? And so it will be, it's a matter of, of dealing with what those changes are, what those outcomes are, 
and w- how they are appropriately managed um, for the safety of people and the environment. Under this system, there will be some precise gene editing techniques that will be exempt from regulation. Those that make changes so small that they're indistinguishable from natural changes. The regime itself has three levels, but they, there will be some things which are exempt and that will be the very minor changes that can occur by gene editing. Because one of the challenges, and international regulators have looked at this, is how you determine that these changes have been made. So it's having a a pragmatic approach to being able to detect the changes, because there's such natural variation goes on in genetic sequence anyway. At the other end... Emily says techniques like transgenic modification, that moving of genes between organisms, is likely to come under higher regulatory scrutiny. In terms of who makes these decisions, there will be a new business unit set up within the EPA and a regulator appointed by the minister. And the regulator will receive advice from two committees, um, the Māori Advisory Committee and the Technical Advisory Committee, in making their assessment and coming up with any risk management plan that needs to be put in place if approval was given. Now, these new regulations will also abide by the laws already on the books. So, maybe an important example. The implantation of genetically modified embryos is prohibited by the Human Assisted Reproductive Technology Act. And that's not changing. It's early days in this. The proposed gene technology bill was just announced in August. So there's lots of work to be done. The minister um, has said that the legislation should appear in the House by the end of the year and that it will undergo a full select committee process um, in in the new year. So we anticipate that that's obviously a a lot of work to get to to bringing the legislation for Cabinet and and House consideration. So that work is being done. Many of the questions that that are coming up are about exactly where different techniques and different modifications and um, different processes will fit within the legislation. So we're doing some work around the technical advisory group is giving some consideration and advising on some of those ways in which we can define those different parts of the regulatory regime to make sure that we can move from our current settings to our new settings when the legislation comes into force. So yeah, She's busy, but this is a whole new world for Emily, and I wondered how it's been. It's been a a real privilege to work alongside the policy people in developing this work and to learn, you know, obviously from my perspective, learn how how legislation is is worked upon and how new legislation is put in in place. So a lot of of learning there um, and a lot of careful consideration. So I keep on coming up with new bits of jargon that the policy team throw at me. Um, but um, I'm, you know, quite unlike science, which has no jargon at all. Zero jargon. I was just about to say, <laughs> surely you throw some back at them. I, I do my best. I give them a, give them a run for their money. You know, when they make me feel inadequate from my my, my lack of understanding about the, about the legislative um, regimes and parliamentary processes. So um, it, it's fascinating, and I mean, it has been a real privilege to work alongside that team to help um, bring new legislation to the House for consideration. Now, obviously, Emily has got skin in the game. But what does she hope the proposed new legislation will do for researchers? I'm hoping it encourages the scientific community to get on with doing some great work and to bring those opportunities to fruition to create value for New Zealand. So I know there's a a lot of ambition out there, um, that there was much work to be done to realise that potential, but I'm hoping it gives them the boost that many are are looking for to see that there's a clearer regulatory pathway for that work. And for the public? I want people to end up feeling this well protected. This is not just a green light for all activities, but this is creating a far more nuanced system which responds to the changes in genetic technologies that have occurred over the last 28 years and and the opportunities that we have to pursue some really exciting applications. And look, 
there's going to be much more to come on this. When the bill gets introduced to Parliament, with all the details of what's exempt and what fits in which risk tier, and when it goes to select committee stage and it's open for public submissions. Based on what happened in the initial conversations around genetic modification in New Zealand in the 90s, and the pushback that some institutions have faced since then, there's likely to be some strong opinions and robust debates. But that's how this works. Science creates different tools, and then it's up to us to decide how, why, and under what circumstances they should be used. And after 28 years of advances in gene technology, it appears it's time for another conversation. Thanks to Damien Christie and Professor Emily Parker. Visit rnz.co.nz slash genomics to watch the videos. There's four of them available now and more to come. Or you can find them on the RNZ YouTube channel. This episode was produced by me and Damien Christie with help from Ellen Rikers and executive producer Liz Garten. Sound engineering was by Phil Benj and this episode was recorded with help from Ataguaxis Radio. Te nākwe i mai. Thanks so much for listening. Ko clerk in Kananaho. Have a great week. Kia pai, the wiki.